Uh, what do you call that ham? Bone in. Bone in. <laughs> I had ham and eggs. Ham and bone potatoes. in. Eggs, potatoes, oh, chicken. Uh, a sour Bananas, cream glazed donut. And, and, and a banana. Raisin bran. Yogurt. Yogurt. Yeah. I had Cheerios. Honey yeah. Cheerios. Yeah. Yeah. Cheerios. Yeah. yeah. I was going to make eggs, but it's too complicated. Was it good? Fantastic. There's a city, it's close to Toronto, it's called Hamilton. There's a bunch of musicians and engineers and producers there. Most of them have won uh, major awards like the, the Junos or the Grammys. There's even this guy who won the Order of Canada. I could go into all the different meanings of music of the hammer. I came up with nine, but my wife thinks that that would be too much. So I give you music of the hammer. Every day for you. Probably sleep as late as possible and then eat Fruit Loops and then go swimming and then go to an arcade and then eat pizza and then drink beer and watch VHS. Cold pizza? No, but hot pizza probably. Like from, like I'd want to order it if it's the perfect day. Like I wouldn't want Dr. Oakers. <laughs> Me and Jesus Christ got on the Hamilton Tiger Cats Labor Day game and I they hated Toronto Argonauts from the visitor stand. I always knew that. My name is B.A. Johnson. I am a entertainer. If you were to nuke Toronto, would you spare Oshawa? I, 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 I would nuke Toronto if I could. And I would spare Oshawa if you could get a nuke that would do that. Just because Oshawa is, like, less annoying than Toronto is. So, <laughs> you have a beer named after you. I believe there is, yeah. It comes out, I think, tomorrow. It's called, uh, it's a new malt liquor called Old B.A. Johnson's Finest. Let's go drinking on a, on a Friday night. And there's a super cute girl sitting on the Jesus is right. And she's been talking to some jabroni in a tap out shirt all night. And I say, Jesus, will she go home with him? And Jesus says, B.A. not on my watch. And then the locusts, they fly in. And the jabroni, he has got no skin. Always knew that Jesus was from Hamilton. Always knew that Jesus was from ha, ha, Hamilton. So why did Lou Molinero ask me to bring you a loaf of bread? I have no idea. You have, I guess that's... I'm very confused. Yeah, Lou, Lou has the answers. I do need bread, so it worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Lou Molinero. I am a co-owner of the St. Hollywood, and I'm the uh, talent buyer for all the entertainment that happens in this room. The more prominent that Hamilton becomes as a market, the more Toronto becomes very protective of their shows. Yeah. And it's a catch-22, it's a double-edged sword, because we want to toot our horn, and we really want the rest of the world to know how great of a market we are, but the more that uh, we emphasize that fact, the more that the competition gets greater. The more noticed you get, and the more... The more noticed you get, and the more that Toronto really steps in and says, we can't afford to sell Toronto or Hamilton a date because we need those Hamiltonians to support our shows because we're so close geographically. There's a bit of an edge about the city. You're never fully um, feeling 100% safe, <laughs> which always kind of makes you a On little edge. smarter. <laughs> yeah, you a little know? streetwiser, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But at the same point, uh, if you're down and out, someone's gonna help you. Uh, the outpour of love for Jack Peddler, for example, you know, just, it, it, it was moving. There's substance to that. Jack Peddler, drummer, I'm also a front man too, so I kind of, I like to move around the stage. But basically the main thing, I'm a drummer. All right, you lived in uh, New York and worked in the New York music scene. What would, uh, did you make an album? Or? Uh, yes, I did. I, uh, I, well, uh, first I went down and I played with Coyote Shivers, uh, you know, toured with Kiss. How'd they treat you as an opening band? They kind of, well, we were the only band that got paid. Oh, really? Because we we're able to do our whole set without, without running off. Why would you run off? Well, because you get beer and stuff thrown at you. Really? Yeah. People just, we want kiss. I had Soylent. Soylent Green? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a chemical slurry of, uh, Human. of nutrients. They just drank it. I like those too. I had a bagel. I had pancakes with peaches built right in them. <laughs> I had a banana. Just a banana? Yeah, that's all I've been able to have so far. All right. <laughs> 
toast with peanut butter and honey. I'm eating on camera right now. So that's your breakfast, what is it? Black coffee. Okay. I had a kale salad. <laughs> Are you really? Are you sitting <laughs> here? A kale salad? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Harrison Kennedy. I'm a singer, musician, writer, uh, telling the truth and shaming the devil. <laughs>you know, what would make you go faster down the hill? Like, do you need to be closer to the ground with small tires or could you get bigger tires? The tires have to be really hard or should they be soft? You know, should they be solid ones? You know, you've had ball bearings. How do you, you know, do you need one with the ball bearings? So you start thinking, should you put more grease in it? What happens? You know, all like, it was fun, man. It was great. Yeah. And they built, they would build a platform up on the top of the hill over here. And so you were quite high, about as high as this, this is right here down to the floor so you'd get that start Woohoo! <laughs> no breaks no breaks you know it stopped when it stopped no helmets <laughs> no breaks helmets, no, no helmets no <laughs> if you fell and hurt yourself you got up and Question put it. a bandit on or whatever yeah. but yeah that was it man <laughs> oh we the people from sea to shine and see we gotta stand together in solidarity Black, white, red, or yellow, the many shades of brown. In this world of the living, together we are bound. We used to just sit and at a table, you know, and they say, okay, like for instance, that table over there, something on it. Okay, write a song about that glass. Your opening statement would be an emotional statement. Glasses on the table, sitting empty still. My love is gone, oh Lord, I don't know why she's gone. And then you, you put the next line would be, I treated her so bad, and not the best life I ever had. You know, and then there'd be like a hook, you know, glass on the table, empty again. Just like my heart, oh baby, oh baby, where you been? So you did you know, the next one, you know, and you'd end it. So, so you'd have to you, tell you the story. You just made this up right now. As we're I'm talking. just making it up now. And so that's what you did. My, my latest album, which is on uh, Electrify Records, just got released last week. And it's called Who You Tellin'. And I've got uh, Jimmy Bosco on it, playing fiddle. And uh, uh, Alec Fraser playing a kind of like this slap bass. And... Uh, Jack DeKaiser is playing the guitar on it, and uh, uh, they have talent and they have passion. The two things is necessary. Oh, the blue solution that stares us in the face. We are members of the human race. Divide and conquer, such an evil game. Brother against brother, it's just a cry and shame. Just a cry and shame, just a cry and shame. My name is Jack DeKaiser, and I'm a guitar player, singer, band leader, songwriter. Where did you grow up? I spent 10 years in England, 10 years in Hamilton, and the last 40 in the Toronto area. Was Hamilton any influence on, uh, on your career? Absolutely, yeah. Hamilton's where I started playing guitar first. Hamilton is where I uh, started my musical career. You've worked with Harrison Kennedy, Etta James, yeah. Blue Rodeo, Bo Diddley. It sounds like it might be kind of fun. Um... Yeah, working with Bo Diddley was always fun. I did about four shows with him. I remember the first time we were re rehearsing at the uh, Alma Combo, and he, and Bo looked at the drummer and he goes, "You know the Bo Diddley beat?" And the guy goes, "Yeah, yeah." He goes, "Don't play it." <laughs> so how many gigs do you play a year? These days, I probably average about 140, probably. How many years have you been keeping up this pace? Since '85, for sure. What's the greatest challenge facing an artist today? Keeping your name out there, uh, promotion, doing all that kind of thing. 
there's so much uh, competition. The, the, the good thing about the internet is that you can really advertise, you know, Facebook and, and the internet really gives you a platform to get your music and your name out there. That When I was a young person, you needed a lot of money to, to make a record, you need a lot of money to make a, a film, you need a lot of money to make a even a photograph. Nowadays you can do all that, make high quality stuff for a lot less money, so I think it's a, a, a good time to be a, an artist. Do you like cold pizza? Yes, I do. In the morning? Not in the morning so much, no. That's the best. No. So like a slice of pizza. Or pizza, you know, I mean, it doesn't... doesn't what about cold pizza for breakfast? Yeah, absolutely. Cold pizza is the best. Anyone can buy some gear, get a microphone, put it in, in front of a guitar amp and hit record. And they can get a great sound, but it's keeping the vibe and the energy and the life to the session that... Well, anyway, that, that, that makes the great engineers is the guys that can keep the session going positively. Uh, Duke I'm, Foster, engineer. Scott Peacock, engineer. Uh, Dan Hosh, I engineer and I produce records. Tristan Miller, engineer, technician. What makes a good engineer and which one of you is the best? <laughs> <laughs> I am. Fuck that, I am. <laughs> I don't know. I got a Juno, so... <laughs> Honestly, like so much of engineering is just like you have to get sounds, you have to make things sound good, but just like dealing with people um, and you have to be totally cool and totally relaxed. And... Do you find musicians are savvy to how to record professionally? No. Sometimes they, they think they are. <laughs> <laughs> so how good are you guys? Can you replicate that John Bonham sound? Well, you should you should pay us for a day of recording. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. you. We, a lot of the things we do are based on project rates. So it's one price for everything. And that way people can come in and they don't have to worry about the, the time. Yeah, the time. And, and you know, if it's like if a singer's not getting a take one day, we can wrap up at dinner time and come back the next day and, and try it out. And no one has to worry about, you know, timing and stuff. Why does Dallas Green or Feist or the RKLs come here? What what draws musicians of that caliber? The size of the space. The room is, yeah, is one of the biggest sellers, I think. And our pedigree, what's been done here. So people know, you know, you know, the room's the right size. It sounds really good. It's comfortable here. It's relaxed, laid back. It's easy and nice to work in. Who's the most memorable person you recorded here? Eddie Hirsch. Oh yeah, we did. We did a session with Eddie Hirsch from the from the Black, Black Crows. Crows. And uh, it was amazing watching him play. So good. Yeah, that's the most memorable person I, yeah. I think I've recorded. Yeah. Do you want to talk about any recent clients you guys have had? No. <laughs> um, my name is Amy King, and uh, I am originally from Newfoundland, and I'm a music producer, recording engineer, and we get to play instruments on stuff too, so I call myself a musician uh, here at Grand Avenue. And Hamilton actually, a lot of the, the culture here reminds me a lot of home, and people kind of look at me funny when I say that because, you know, we're, we're landlocked in a sense. Yeah, we have the lakes, but whatever, they're lakes. Um, but the work ethic and the people uh, really do remind me a lot of East Coasters. So that is a huge plus. I, I have no desire to go and live and work in Toronto or New York or L.A. I, the, this is the perfect size for me. It's like home. It's, uh, it's cozy. We get to make music in an old house that is just oozing with character and history and I get to do it with people that I, I love and that, that are like family to me so no plans but maybe one day we'll see. So what producers or engineers do you find um, inspiring? Oh I get to work with Bob every day he could have been uh, one of the top guys on the planet living in New York or LA Nashville but he chose to raise a family here in Hamilton and keep this place going, which was so important to this local community and to Canada, actually. So uh, I find him very, very inspirational. Guy's been doing it for more than, like, way more than half his life. And he's managed to uh, pull through that and, and raise a great family. Now he's got grandkids and stuff. And, to, and that's a bigger accomplishment than most people realize, being able to put food on your table and your kids through school by doing this crazy. My name is Bob Deutsch. I've owned this place since 1985 and worked here since we built it in 76. So 
I've been around the place for its uh, life. And I do everything around here. <laughs> Most of the work around here is not necessarily a Marshall stack with a Les Paul. And in that case, nobody at home knows what you put on the instrument as, so as long as that sounds really cool when, when it gets there. But with the human voice or an acoustic guitar and that sort of thing, uh, people at home know what that singer sounds like. So whatever I record has to represent that and uh, technically be better than they really sound. That's, the, that's what I'm going for. You know, between a transistorized mic and the tube mic on the vo human voice, they're, they're, it's, it's instant. You go, that one. And sure enough, it'll end up being the tube mic. You still use 57s, I saw one kicking around. Oh yeah, I put that on, on amplifiers. Uh, I use it as an aiming mic uh, for vocalists. I don't like to put the real microphone in front of their face. I like to put the Shure right there, and I put the real mic off to the side. A placebo. It is, yeah, and I don't even hook a cord up to it. And basically that gives them their stage characteristics where they will work, <laughs> whereas with the tube mic, they think they have to stand there. So when they scream something really loud, they're really too close. The other thing is it avoids pops, like pops happen here. I don't want a big jumbo pop filter. Out here, that doesn't exist. And more importantly, the S's, the sibilance that happens with a close mic, it's not the mic's fault. If you, if you put your ear this far from a person's mouth that's talking, the S's are overwhelming. So they come out of your mouth like a bit of a needle. So I get the mic over here a bit and then the S's and the pops are gone, and you know, they sound more like they do in a room when you're standing there. So is the, is the, is, is the, is the 57 actually plugged in, or is it just? Nah. I mean, sometimes I plug it in if they, <laughs> if they feel insulted that I'm, because some people go, no, I don't need that. Well, they do need it, because as soon as you put a tube mic up here and there's nothing else, they're, they're over here, you know, and I don't want that. They get the sensation it's the, it's the 57 picking it up anyways. I mean, in the headphones to, to the singer, they don't know the difference. You worked uh, with Grant Avenue Studios? Yes. Love the place. I'm, I'm there in the summertime. This summer again. Yeah, I just like their professionalism. I, I can't imagine going to, you know, northern Montreal or wherever, and building a studio like that. Well, they, they, everybody told us, uh, you know, first of all, to build a studio in, in, in Canada like that. Second, to build a studio out in Quebec. Right. A, after the FLQ crisis, no way. Luckily, uh, I was working with Cat Stevens at the time, and Steve was our first clientele, even when we were banging stuff, you know, and uh, with mosquitoes. You had the, the police were there? It actually started off with Sting coming alone. That's where he wrote Every Little Thing is, Everything is Magic, and where we did most of the recording for that song. Uh, we, had, you know, we had Nazareth come in for four or five albums. Na Rush, of course. Uh, you know. So it's something to be said about the studio when people think of it as their home. You did uh, Perfect Strangers, right, with Deep yeah, Purple? Yeah, it, it sold a lot. I mean, it sold like something like 24 million copies. Well, you worked with what, Tom Jones that decade? You did that worked James with Tom Bond? Jones, yep. Yeah. Worked with Tom Jones. and uh... He's cool. He's cool for a guy with a perm, right? <laughs> yeah. I never really talked to him. Oh, really? Everything was uh, done by translators. Oh, really? Mm. And they were all Welsh. Oh. So suddenly, if they wanted to be talking privately, they were all talking Welsh. Oh, wow. And nobody understands Welsh, except not even the for Welsh. the Welsh, <laughs> you know. So let's talk about the Bee Gees. Uh, oh, the Bee, uh, it, was, it was wonderful. It was one of uh, my best experiences I've ever had. Um, was that at Moran Heights? That was in Moran Heights. And what happened was, uh, I, I think they had to go and record outside of the United States because of tax reasons. But here they, they arrived and... And with family, you know, uh, nannies and the whole thing. Uh, was it Saturday Night Fever, or was it just some songs from that? Just or? songs from from the Bee Gees singing, like uh, uh, "You Should Be Dancing." Dancing. Yeah, you should be dancing. You, how deep is your, you know, gashmata? Nice. 
um, you know, uh, staying alive, you know, that, uh, so anyway, you know, subsequently, you know, when we read the script, we thought it was, geez, a guy that, you know, works in a paint store and wants to dance, okay. Wow, you've worked with King Crimson. Yeah, I was the engineer at uh, Wessex when King Crimson was there to record uh, in the court of the Crimson King. Tina Turner, I mastered her album. Did you meet her? Or? I met her, and she gave me a wonderful hug, and she smelled great. Nice. <laughs> Who wouldn't want a hug from <laughs> Tina Turner, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. April Wine, Atlas Studio. Yeah. Kim Stockwood. I mastered that. I Mother Earth. I mastered that. Kimbo Logo. I co-produced it and engineered it. What do you think of uh, Melissa Marchese? She has a voice of the ageless. I mean, that uh, she's one of the most talented people around. Okay, what's your name and what do you do? Uh, Melissa Marie Marchese. I'm a songwriter and a singer. Keep moving toward the light. I live in Hamilton on my own. Hold your head up to the sky. Who or what inspired you to get into music? Claim your flag. When I met up with Elaine Overholt. She's um, an amazing vocal coach. Know that it will be all right. She was working on the movie Chicago with Richard Gere and Catherine Zeta-Jones. About a year, year and a half later, she called me up and said she had time for me. So then I started going to Toronto to study with her. And like the first time I walked into her house, uh, I will never forget. I was just this young little thing coming from Niagara Falls. And I will never forget. I opened the door and there was a note on the fridge that said, Mom, Richard Gear called. And I was like, where am I? Okay, what was it like um, working with Nick Blagona? He made me believe in myself in a way that I never even dreamed I could. He's so genuine and he's just been around and he's seen so much. Because of that, he has this amazing ability to set the mood to make a record. And he knows how to make an artist feel comfortable and like squeeze the best out of them. It was just a blessing every single day that I got to work with him. Yeah, how many songs was on the album? Uh, we did 12 songs with Nick. Yeah, full record. And then we, we broke up right as soon as it came out. I was super depressed for a solid year, at least. I was helping raise my boyfriend and that band's kids. You know, they call me mama. Keep moving toward the light. Now I now fucking have everything. All right, here we go. Keep moving toward the light. And I said, I gotta do something about this. I never really pictured myself as a songwriter. I wasn't writing any songs in that band. It wasn't until like I, I kind of like hit rock bottom, and it was really the city that helped pull it out of me. You know, our incredibly healthy, vibrant scene is just so damn inspiring. When you're seeing your your girlfriends, one you know, one day I'm on stage with Tara Lightfoot, and the next minute, you know, her career's taken off and she's off to outer space. So I bought my guitar, learned how to play it, started writing some songs. So that's kind of what I've been doing for the last year and a half, is just playing my songs out wherever I can, with whoever I can. It's come time that I've been playing them out enough, I have to record them. Because everywhere I go, everyone's like, where can I hear your songs? Where can I hear your songs? And you can't. <laughs> you have to come see a show. Know that it will be just fine.
I like cats. What's your name and what do you do? My name is Doug McClement, and I'm a location, multi-track recording audio, well, multi-track audio recording engineer. It's a, it's a branch of the recording studio industry, but we bring the studio to the entertainer. You just want to get through it without a train wreck, basically. You know, because there's mistakes that... And then there's mistakes your mom would notice, you know. Like my mom would be watching the Oscars, you know, when Celine Dion went to the mic and that wasn't, that was a mistake, right? I said, yeah, that was, a, like if the floor tom mic cuts out, I know it and the drummer knows it and, and Somebody else. that's about it. And, and I'll worry about it, but there's that. But then there's like that, when people are reporting the next day after the Grammys that, hey, James Hetfield's mic was off, like Joe Schmo noticed that, right? Like that, that's a, that's a, that you don't want to want that. that that's just your worst nightmare. And it's going to, you know, I, I've been fortunate. I really haven't had it, something that level happen. But it, that's not, I'm never not going to say it's never going to happen because stuff happens. But boy, that, that would just be, you know, when people are, are talking about it the next day at the water cooler, that's, just, you know, there was an audio problem on the, on the Oscars. It's like, oh God, you know, I don't know how you'd live that down. I mean, even on those shows, we've got any award show that we've got their mic plot and then there's a wireless mic on a stand at each side of the stage called stage left spare, stage right spare. And then in addition to that, there's a hardwired SM58 at the, in, the, in between the guy's monitors at, at his feet. So you just pick up. Call, and, and on, the, on the input list, it's labeled ultimate spare. And if everything fails, they just hand him that. That's why I couldn't get over the thing at the Grammys, how, how they got through three verses of No James Hetfield. At the Juno, Sony would have been out there with a mic if they were standing there holding it in front of his mouth. And you know, Daniel Lanwell came out to receive an award once at one of the shows, and he, like a Lifetime Achievement Award or something, and he came out with an acoustic guitar, which was like, <laughs> and he starts playing, and, then, and the director, we can't hear the guitar. Well, yeah, like, <laughs> something expected. you know. So finally he got, he got, he realized, and he held it up, he did a Johnny Cash, he kind of held it up to the vocal mic, but but I couldn't get over the intercom. Like, we're not hearing the guitar. Well, <laughs> You see a microphone on it <laughs> or a wire coming off it anywhere? When exactly were you going to tell us that he was going to be carrying an acoustic guitar out onto the stage? Oh. It's a privilege to get paid for what you like to do. I mean, when you're in high school, you think everybody ends up doing what they like to do. And then you go back to your high school reunion and you realize that 80% of the people you went to high school hate their jobs eight hours a day. And they just count, well, five more years and I can retire and do what I want to do. And I'm thinking, really? Like you've waited till you're 58 to... I, I just count myself among the lucky guys that, that found something that I like to do early in my life. Because some people don't find what they like to do until they're 30 or 35, too. I, I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be something in music. I realized pretty early on I wasn't going to make a living as a musician. I'm, I'm not, so I figured, well, maybe I can get on the other side of the glass and become, you know, in the gold rush, the guy who has the steady job is the guy who sells picks and shovels, not the guy who's panning for gold. And, and so we're kind of in the pick and shovel business here. And, and uh, I've seen so many, I've seen disco come and go and punk come and go and glam and all these different musical styles come and go and they all need to be recorded. The Wolf. The Wolf. The Wolf. Okay, my name's Dave Beatty. Been in the music industry uh, about 50 years almost. Just try to find people that are motivated like you and try to help them do stuff you know whatever you're up against it's a different flavor every day and I, I, I like that it keeps me going you know how was it playing with Dan Lanois it was great it was great he was you know a soulful player he liked all the Wilson Pickett stuff and all that and Bob Doidge who uh, was the bass player he, he was had more musicality he could understand he figured all the harmonies and he also played trumpet and stuff like that so we had a good, you know, three voice, strong three voice band. It was, it was really good. Can you explain how the real world of concert promotions work? Well, that's a good one. When I was with CPI, Concert Productions International, it formed a brotherhood with uh, Don K. Don in Montreal and Brimstone in the Midwest and Periscope out West. And we would end up buying the tours. We'd like buy Tina Turner for, you know, seven nights or something like that, and we put her in Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, you know, right across the whole country. We started putting these tours together, which was the foundation for the Logic and the Live Nation. And we just kept growing. We were doing maybe 150 concerts a year, minimum. 
and we bought another company in the States that had 189 concerts a year. And then we just kept, so we just kept buying the tours. Then Michael Cole, my boss, he ended up, he would like hire the Rolling Stones for a year. And he would take care of all the merchandise. We'd have all the rights, the merch and, and the, the concerts and all that different stuff. And we just, you know, pay Mick and Keith for the year. And we started doing with Pink Floyd and David Bowie and U2. And that sort of grew into the Live Nation. What's the most memorable moment? It, it was, I guess, working with Paul McCartney was really, very interesting for me because I was such a fan. And, you know, seeing these people live and just realizing that the human aspect of being part of their day and what they're going through. And they got 20 people working for them and, and there's a lot going on. And I thought uh, it was just seemed profound, you know, standing there when I'd walk Michael Jackson off the stage uh, while the other guys finished the, the song and we're sitting in the van for five, 10 minutes, you know, waiting for the band, just to you have know, a little talk and just little moments like, wow, that's Michael Jackson, <laughs> you know, or that's Paul McCartney. But I was good at what I did too at, at that time. And so I understood, you know, what they were up against, and I just made sure that their day was fun. I did about maybe almost a thousand concerts for them wow. over about nine years. So anybody that toured in the 80s, I got to hang out with for a few days. You know, I spent like seven days with Frank Zappa, and I spent a lot of days with Bowie, I had three weeks with Dylan. I, just, I had a really good opportunity to kind of get into the heads of what's going on with these people during the day. So that was a good experience. That was after I had uh, been international tour manager with John Baldry for three years. The next thing I know, I'm driving John around. We're doing Ronnie Hawkins' show with John Lee Hooker and all these interesting things. Elton John's calling, and I saw, hey, it's kind of cool. You know Grant Slater? Yeah, I do. Apparently he toured with Baldry for a while, or? He, he was the keyboard player. <laughs> I remember him boring my van to pick up his B3 and then having my transmission sees on, on the way up the claps and cut. <laughs> That's a big hill. <laughs> Grant's are really talented. Grant Slater. I'm a keyboard player for hire. So you recorded an album with Teenage Head. Uh, which album was that in which studio? Frantic City. And I'm almost positive of a shot at Grant Avenue. Yeah, I, I actually played that piano if it's the same piano at uh, Grant I Avenue. I think nothing's changed there, so I'm sure it's the same piano. <laughs> yes. And I still love the studio. Yeah. I love uh, the guy that runs it. It's great. Bob Deutsch. Bob Deutsch still there? Yep. Good. And Amy King. Have you met Amy King? Or I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. nice too. Yeah. yeah, she's great. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. So uh, you're Elton John's replacement uh, with Long John Baldry. Uh, uh, about 10 years afterward. Have you seen that? Have you seen that list of musicians who... After who Elton have, John? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they're inconsequential. No, There's Elton John, blah, 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 Grant Slater. <laughs> I first met you, I think it was in Kitchener at uh, Rhinoceros. They had a reunion. Oh, well, yeah, it was at, Kitchener, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was with Joe Salagi, and you were wearing a Nucleus shirt. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, your affair with uh, Nucleus? I wanted to put, I wanted to play that music. So I called my friends who are also into that music, like Paul DeLong and people like that. So a good friend of mine, Mike Camino, bass player, he ended up playing um, bass in Nucleus. So, we, so he says he knew the guys. He knew the original guys. He said, I'll call them up and we'll have a meeting and they'll see if they want to give it a shot. So I, th I thought that you originally were just going to do a cover band. Is that what happened? And then you... A tribute band, so to speak. Yeah, but you did, you did a tribute band with the real members. Until I, yeah, until I <laughs> come across Mike and he says, I know the guys, so we'll, go, we'll talk to them. And I went, okay, and I walked into that room shaking. One of the guy's homes in, in the East End. I thought they would say, get out of here, kid. Yeah, right? yeah. But actually, we're all, we're all the same age, it turned out. So yeah. We had a rehearsal and they went, wow, let's do it, right? So we rehearsed about 20, a year and a half of rehearsing. One year and a half of rehearsing, because it was very... Difficult music to learn and memorize. And yeah, long story short, we, we did it at uh, the docks, and it was great. So that was a that was a highlight. I've had a lot of highlights in my career. That was that was up here somewhere, right? It's just so we did one more gig after that about two years later. And that was it in a restaurant, I think. I mean, nobody knew who they were for a, a club owner to hire us to go nucleus, right? And the club owner's like thirty five years old. Yeah, he has no idea. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I'm, I'm actually just 
I'm tingling talking about it because <laughs> it was, you know, you love the album. Of course. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Who else have you worked with? Is this, this, this is a name dropping segment. This is, this, is the name, <laughs> this is the name drop. Yeah, if you want to go my, to my website, can I say it? Yeah. Grantslater.com. It has everybody I've played with. But back, going back, I mean, I worked with George Oliver for years, who most of us know, still going at it. Blue Eye Prince of Soul. Um, but I've, I've backed up Putula Clark, and um, I've been working with Cole Wilkinson for the last 13 years. Who really? He was, original so you know who he is Rich, original phantom of the phantom of the opera phantom and i tour across canada and some of the states with him which is going from nucleus to him is like <laughs> like here and here it's just miles apart but I, I love him so what kind of music are you doing with him is it more classical stuff well, classical stuff we do the hits so to speak as any band does you know bring them home the hits from les mis and the hits from phantom okay what means the most to you in life in general? Great friends who are all musicians, mostly musicians. And I, you know, I just, they mean a lot to me. And we, some of them I've known for 40 years plus. And, um, you know, I might see them once a month doing a gig once every two weeks, once every six months. When I, when I see them, it's like I haven't, I haven't seen my brother or my sister for years. They're all good friends and good musicians. Um, that means a lot to me to have, to, to be in that company you know, people that I enjoy working with. I'm almost tearing up. Watch it. <laughs> What's a perfect day for you? This. This. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I'm sitting in my backyard and somebody's asking me questions about my life and it makes me think about my life as a musician. But uh, seriously, um, what's the question again? Thank you very much. That's it? That's it, yeah. Oh, you must have more than that. Man, 13. I got more names to drop. Uh, Mike Treblecock, and I'm a musician, and uh, I guess I'm a filmmaker as well, an artist, and I just do what I can. You toured for about a decade with the Killjoys. What was the greatest revenue stream with that band? Um, you know, record sales, it all went back to the record company. Uh, the concert sales it went, it went into, you know, we were paying for merch as well, so, you know, we didn't, we didn't directly make money off of the t-shirts. And when you're, when you're signed to a record label, you've got to pay off all of those debts first before you start making any money from record sales. So um, You have to pay off debts to the record company? To the record company, yeah. Because they've paid for all your recordings and for the publicity and for the, you know, well, that's it. We didn't get really tour, tour support or anything. So they really just front you. They'd loan you the money, essentially, is all they're doing. Yeah. So there's no real advantage to being signed by a major label if you have to pay for it in the end anyways. Yeah, it's a bit of a gamble because... Uh, you're not always going to uh, pay off all of that debt, right? But you could pay off all that debt, and then you know, over and above whatever that amount is, you'll you'll start making a percentage of the of the sales. Is there uh, is there payola going on at radio stations? Well, like I said, we went out for a lot of dinners. I don't know. Maybe that's sort of a subtle, <laughs> <laughs> a subtle payola, <laughs> you know. But it's just a sandwich. <laughs> I'm, my name is Ed Gibro. I play guitar and I sing in uh, simply a band called Simply Saucer. My name is Kalina Phillips and I'm a singer and I sing with Simply Saucer. I also sing with my own jazz group. What's the name of your jazz group? Kalina Phillips Jazz Quartet. A, a session singer of note as well. David Clayton Thomas. Yeah, a lot of people over the years. What song did you sing with Triumph? Oh gosh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you land such a talented singer? <laughs> <laughs> She's been treating me like I'm some kind of friend. Martha's back. Um, I'm also playing with Simply Saucer. I play guitar for that band. There's a big uh, cult following with that band, right? Yeah, and it seems to keep growing as well. Where'd you pick them up at the local county zoo? 
Thurston Moore is a big fan of Simply Saucer. No way. They've gotten and they've gotten articles. They just had an article in Shindig magazine in Britain. They've got they've had stuff in Mojo. They've they're, like they've their their influence is really widespread. The door slams again. And they get a lot of respect from from a lot of different places. So you've got this fantastic singer. You've got the Killjoys guitarist. <laughs> Yeah, and we've had uh, Glenn Milcham from Blue Rodeo doing shows with us as well. And um, Ed Roth, we have a keyboard player who played with Rick James and was at Grand Avenue in the Lanois uh, era, as a, worked as a producer there. So Ed is just like uh, all around fantastic. <laughs> And Kevin, uh, yeah, Kevin Kristoff um, has been with me 40 years on the bass guitar. How are the turnouts when you guys go to like New York and places like that? Is it uh, pretty good turnouts? Yeah, good turnouts, yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, the, the clubs are packed. And people are uh, very happy to see us because uh, uh, we're more of a cult band. Not to mention the drugs and the cons and the crooks. Martha's back. The door slams again. When I when I started going out with her, I didn't even tell her about the band. <laughs> I didn't really talk about it. I thought, well, I don't think so. I, you know, I don't think it would be her bag. You know, but uh, <laughs> everything's my bag. Some kind of friend. She drinks my wine. Lena Phillips. My name is Grit Laskin. I'm a guitar maker. You played with the great folk legend Stan Rogers. What was that like? I made his guitars and um, he recorded me on his label. And um, yes, I did play with him when it was possible. I've certainly played on his three of his uh, albums in studio. And the live album, of course, I was on stage for that. Nice. I bought Alaskan guitar, but it's the sound that is a perfectly balanced instrument. It's just, it's just a joy to play. Edgar Bro of Simply Saucer bought one of your guitars a while ago. He has it insured for $12,000. Do you think that that is a fair valuation for one of your guitars? At 12000 it depends on the year. I mean, right now, my guitars are more expensive than that. You know, but but in the you know in the very early days they were only hundreds of dollars. So it depends when it was made. But one thing I can say is that any time I see one of my guitars on the used market, it's always selling for more than they paid. Always. Yeah. Uh, if you ordered a guitar from me today, and I expect you to do that before you leave, of course, of course. right? If you ordered it, sixteen thousand nine hundred U.S. is my base price for a guitar, but it includes a lot of things that didn't used to happen. I mean, I don't make lesser models. There's, they're always rosewood, ebony's, you know, the best machine heads. Even the case you saw out in the other room that's carbon fiber, that comes with all my guitars and they sell for $1,500 separately. And there's other innovations on my guitars, a side port sound hole, a second sound hole on the upper boat of the side, the bevel where the arm comes around. We just came up with this responding to players who said, I'd love to be able to hear my guitar a little stronger. You know, what about a sound hole up here? And, and both Serge and I, Sergey de Young and I, uh, a builder also Canadian, um, he tried one and I didn't realize he, I, he was doing it and I was doing it. And sure enough, the player hears it stronger. It's like some of the air volume isn't just escaping out the sound hole, it's up here and the side effect that we weren't expecting is that it makes the guitar fuller up front no way yeah so even for the listener you're hearing something 
that just seems to get fuller. And so everything sounds fuller. I'm talking about not just bass, but all across the register of the strings, even the treble strings, everything has a different kind of fullness to it, in addition to you hearing the guitar louder as a player. The thing that pushes the price up for me a lot is the inlay art that I do on my guitars. That is always original art. I never, ever repeat a design. Even if you said, well, I really love that inlay you did, and now I want a 12 string, can you do the same inlay? I would say, no. I'd say, let's explore the theme again, but a different way. Do you do that for your own artistic satisfaction? Or? Yeah, but don't tell anybody, okay? Because okay? <laughs> I'm having so much fun. What means the most to me, I think, is not wasting your time on this planet, doing what you can, whether it's in your immediate world, the community you live in, the communities you associate with and hang with, uh, making a difference, doing something that changes things. And I think that like the Order of Canada, you don't get it just because you excel in your field or you're innovative in your field, which is part one. Uh, but you also have to be involved in other things that are effective. And I mean, I'm the, uh, I'm the founder of Borealis Records. It's 21 years now, Canada's folk music label. I'm the, the founder of the Canadian Folk Music Awards that are national juried awards. So to me, that's the overriding thing to make your life worthwhile. Paul Wheeler. George. Uh, Bill. Can't get a word in edgewise. Jack Pedler. Singer, songwriter, drummer. Singer, songwriter. Oh, okay, come on. Dumpster Juice. That's the best. Hey, here we go. Singer, songwriter. Oh, yeah. I got a record deal in uh, New York. New York. That's not true. So what made you? <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty bizarre song, you have to admit, right? So what, what was your inspiration? Uh, well, uh, Hamilton, 1963. Gore Park, just full of rubbies. That's the chair. Oh, I got to stick Jack for a second. Talk about teenage head. So how long did you play with the head and uh, when did you start with them? I started, yeah, 1986. So it's been off and on like since 1986. So Gene's taking your spot there now. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. he's recovering. He also uh, produced a silver cup. Yeah, the teenage last teenage head. head, the last teenage head thing they ever done. I produced that for them with Frankie and Jack and Stevie and Gordy, and that was kind of that was nice for me because it was Frankie wasn't long after that that he passed, but uh, and it was done for the Hockey Night in Canada, and they played it at the start of the Hockey Night in Canada games. You know, how much of an influence was uh, Dan Lanois in your career? Oh, um, is he here? He's not here. Anybody? Well, here comes a friend of his now. Oh, he was great. All right, Polly, are you re you're related to Ken Wheeler? Yes, I am. How are you related to Ken Wheeler? It's my dad's brother. Did you guys talk much about jazz? Uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, I grew up in my house. We went, really didn't listen to rock music. We weren't allowed to. And um, we, uh, I grew up listening to... Uh, uh, you know, big band. Uh, and uh, yeah, I had a, many occasions to play with Ken, so it was kind of fun growing up. So what happened to Ronnie? Why are you guys just the Rockets now? Um, I fired him. I think he died, honestly. <laughs> no, uh, he got sick. Yeah, so too sick to play and we thought, well, I'm well, sick of playing with him. Well, how long has uh, running the Rockets been around? Oh, forever. 35 years? Yeah. 78. Can I tell another Jack Peddler story? Sure. You? Lots of Jack Peddler stories. So we're playing in this, um, it's a hotel. We're a little bit older now. We're like maybe 18. And uh, the non stripper <clears throat> pulled a knife out on the stripper. Because Jack is mine. Yeah. Jack is mine, not yours. Yeah. And the stripper said, oh yeah, and she ran upstairs and uh, grabbed her 38 <laughs> and came down and uh, actually, uh, and threw the stripper, th threw the non-stripper through uh, a glass window. No. In the front of the hotel, like in the, front you know, of the, the hotel. big glass window, right yeah. out onto the yeah, street. Yeah, right out onto the street. Picked her up and threw her right out 
That was uh, Crystal Star. That was the stripper. And that was a, uh, that's where Sounds this saying like came up. <laughs> hey, Crystal, where'd you get the pistol? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. nice. Uh, Andrew Aldridge, uh, guitar player, musician, producer. My name is Mary Simon. I'm a singer-songwriter. I play with Mississippi Bands. Well, how long have you guys been playing together? It was about four years ago. Something like that. Did you guys write that song together? No, no. I wrote it with um, an artist in town named Maddie Simpson. So usually I come to Andrew with the song half finished, and then he adds all these fancy, awesome riffs. So, but Andrew has more recently started singing. Right. So there's something that he didn't do before that he's doing a lot of now. So that's exciting for me. But you got to play with other people. But I should be practicing. Because I consider myself a vocalist first and a guitar player third. So how did you find him? Or how did you find her? How did you guys find each other? I remember our mutual friend Tone Valsic saying, call Andrew, he's not playing enough right now. And so I said, well, would he actually want to play with me? And he did. <laughs> Nick Lagona's wife, MJ, told me that I must include Andrew Aldridge as he's played with everybody. So who have you played with? Well, Danny Michelle, Wild Strawberries, Universal Honey, Sarah Sleen. Catherine Rose, oh Susanna. You like the females? Uh, it sort of, yeah, Danny's the only non-female in the bunch there so far, I guess. For whatever reason, it's, you know, I guess what I do lends itself to that sort of realm. Back in college when I played for 4,000 people, when I get nervous, I get a dry throat, so then I drink lots of water and I really fill my bladder quickly. <laughs> it's a catch-22. Well, this has started off to a really good day because, first of all, Andrew came over in the morning and we rehearsed before we came here. And he brought you breakfast. And he brought me breakfast. Yeah. Visit our website, MississippiBenz.com. Oh, my leg's falling asleep. My name's Tim Tickner. I'm an electronic musician and composer. And You used to write jingles. So how many do you figure you've written? We were doing 300 or 400 that would go to air every year. So, and I did it for, you know, 25 years. Who sang for that singing cow commercial? Can you imagine? How no, I just cow? went into the vocal booth and fired it off in about 15 minutes. And no. that did a bunch of versions of it and then I that was it I forgot about it and then it came on the air and I was like oh I wrote Blax's photography Blax's photography Blax's who got which are now gone but you did the home hardware well, we one did, we did the Pizza Nova 439 oh, oh, Hugga Max Hugga Mugga Hugga Mugga that was a big track and we did also serious stuff with the Einsteins we did I Am Canadian that whole campaign. I mean, some things they just wrote like in second, you know, like, like I wrote Eden's da 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 da, whatever that was. And that was literally took a minute. <laughs> what direction is the music industry going? Uh, it's in a real transition because, you know, uh, people can't make money. Nobody buys CDs anymore and nobody, everybody's streaming music. And a lot of the people think, you know, music should be free. I mean, the economics of it really dictates a lot of what happens because, you, you know, the clubs don't pay any money at all. you got to play for the door, and, you know, it's a tougher go everywhere. 
you know, I mean, New York's changing all those boutique little clubs and studios like studios are going to, you know, it's a real bottom line. And that's in every aspect of, of the entertainment business. Well, change brings opportunity. That's a good thing. Well, there's nothing but change. Yeah. You know, it's not whether it's good or bad or anything. It's just like, no, things are going to change. You know, I mean, that's the way it works. There was some kind of a phenomena happening in Grimsby where, where all these great artists and musicians came from. Steve Hogg, Tim Tuckner, Bob Sterna. Uh, there is uh, uh, Steve Nagus from Saga as well. Three of us actually played with Ronnie Hawkins. Steve Hogg and, and, and Bill Dillon played with Ronnie Hawkins as well. We haven't quite figured it out yet, but one day someone will figure out why it became the Grinsby Triangle. But I got to meet a lot of really interesting people through IMAX. Um, I met most of the directors, um, you know, Michael Bay. Um, he, he, was, uh, he was an interesting guy. Um, Chris Nolan is one of my favorite directors in the world. I just got off a shoot with him last spring uh, f for Dunkirk. Uh, and we're filming in northern France, and then we moved into Amsterdam area f to f do some shots. Really interesting stuff. What's your favorite filming location in terms of, like, exotic? <laughs> you know, the anything. most memorable ones are the ones... Well, see, I brought my Stratocaster with me all the time. So when I got to, to take the Strat out after working all day on the film shoot, go to a club with uh, a couple of the, the grips or, or the cameramen and get on stage and play with a local band. Could you tell us about your accident with the 1959 Gibson Les Paul? I knew you were going to bring that up. So... So when Looking Glass was, was, was finishing up, I decided uh, to check out a band in Kingston and I auditioned for the band. I just strapped my, my Les Paul to the side of the, the motorcycle. And on the way back, I got hit broadside. Um, it, it wasn't my fault. It, it was a beautiful evening. It was in the in middle of July. And uh, my left leg was mangled from, from this this Buick that hit me broadside and it did the same amount of damage to my guitar too so I was pretty upset about that um, the the guitar neck was broken uh, I think the pickups flew off all kinds of things happened to it the case was torn to shreds um, so was my leg and so it took me a year to recover from that one and ever but since then, I've had I've had 25 operations on my left leg and foot because of that accident. But the guitar has only been rebuilt once, and it's and it's like new now. My leg's like new now too. Yeah, yeah. rebuilt. Yeah, rebuilt. We have the technology. Yeah. yeah, they're rebuilding a lot on me these days. Yeah. A six million dollar man. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about the accident from the summer? Yeah, that's uh, that was a surprise. I um. I was moving some equipment from um, from my buddy's place in 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 Welland, and I don't remember anything. Three hours before the accident, and three days after, I I have total memory blockout. And the reason why I'm wearing a hat is because it, I kind of skidded my head on the um, on the QEW as well as um, as losing my left arm. Um, I, when I woke up in the hospital, you know. I, I was of a, a, a pretty good attitude when I woke up because I've had so many operations on my left leg. And when you get an operation on your on your leg, it's such a major part of your body that your whole core is upset. But when I woke up from this, I, I actually almost sat up. I had all these tubes down my my throat and this suction thing on my head. And, but I felt pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, compared to the other operations I've had. Um, uh, so... Uh, so it's not such a bad thing, you know, I'm, I'm adjusting to it. It's not the easiest thing to adjust to, but um, we've got lots of great plans. This is the device that you would use for the lap steel or the pedal steel. You hold it in your left hand and then you move it up and down the strings like that. The only thing you have to watch out is dampening the string and moving it up and down. But um, I'm pretty sure that with the new, one of the new arms, this is going to not is going to be uh, uh, my vehicle to, to get back on stage. So I'm kind of looking forward to getting that arm. Well, I'm looking forward to listening to you play again.
I'm Steve Negus, and I play music. So you were in Saga when you recorded with Krista Berg? Yes. So I, that was just so you, like a hiatus during a downtime you did well, that? No, or? basically what that was is I was, uh, Worlds Apart and Heads or Tails were done with Rupert Hine producing, Steve Taylor engineering. And I had a really good relationship with those guys. They were really, uh, I learned a lot from them, and they really captured Saga's best moments. I think those two albums in particular are probably some of the best recorded Saga music. Uh, they were also, uh, Rupert was also producing Krista Burke. So he loved my drum sound and loved my approach. So he, he flew me over to England to do the album. And uh, that was also with John Giblin, bass player from Kate Bush, Peter Gabriel, uh, Brand X, I think. And he also played with Simple Minds, really great bass player. You know, and his timing was just impeccable. Such a great player. That was really a treat. So Don't Pay the Ferryman, that was on that album, right? Yes, it was. Just because you're successful doesn't give you a license to be an idiot. It really doesn't. And uh, I've maintained that all the way through. I don't feel like a star. I'm making music because I love making music. And I get good at it because I spend the time articulating my craft. It doesn't make me better than anybody. I just happen to be in a different part of my journey than other people are. So I teach and, and I do, uh, as you know, I'm doing uh, clinics for Pearl Drums at the moment. It's part of giving back what, what I've been given. And uh, I think that the young kids, they need more of that. You know, there's, there's less players because there's less opportunity these days. Rabbit. Rabbit. Yeah. When are you going to come out and tell everybody that you're related to Robert De Niro? Uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Steve Hogg. Um, I think the best thing you can do is to walk away from anybody who uh, isn't serious about what they're doing or has ever cheated you. And then everybody you're left with is everybody who is serious and uh, who treats you fairly. And uh, those are all the people I'm playing with now. So uh, to play with uh, various uh, people that I play with now is like a, is a is a joy, and uh, I enjoy just the whole process of. Uh, Getting my stuff together, getting in the car, driving to the gig, playing the gig, driving home, the whole thing, I just, uh, I still really like doing it. We just didn't think about it then Sometimes it seems you don't want to know We just didn't think about it then Sometimes we always... Ah, I screwed it up, sorry. Ah! Now I'm thinking about it, I can't sing it anymore. And I always think about, you know, playing like at Shanghai Stadium for two nights in front of 50,000 people on this big, you know, this huge stage and uh, like being at that sort of level and when you play, uh, you play at, uh, at that level you go, well this is what it's like and then, you know, a few hours later you're sitting in your hotel room and go, well this is actually no different than any other gig. You know, we went out to eat after the gig and then where are we tomorrow? You know, it's like it doesn't, nothing was really any different, it's just the, the, uh, the size the, the scale of things is much bigger, right? And being on a big world tour like that. Uh, I also think about, on that, on that subject, I think about Ian, Ian Thomas. We opened, uh, uh, we were requested by the Beach Boys to open for them. They had heard Ian's records and really liked his music, and they didn't normally have a, uh, an opening band, opening band. And they had requested when they played in Toronto that Ian open for them at Maple Leaf Gardens. So here we are at Maple Leaf Gardens opening for the Beach Boys, and you go, Wow, and like the Toronto crowd was, was really supportive. They're like, yeah, it's our, our hometown band here opening. And that was on a Sunday night, and we actually wound up doing about four or five gigs with the Beach Boys. And Monday, uh, we were at the Matador in Cambridge to, you know, 17 people. And I think that no matter where you wind up, you hopefully make the best of uh, the situation that you're put in. I think I've been lucky, and I think I've uh, been fortunate to have met and worked with uh, all these people that I've, that I've worked with up until now and I'm fortunate to still be 
uh, playing in the music business. Somehow we always made it home. I like gorillas. Gorillas? Yeah. Like humans in gorilla suits or real gorillas? I like, well, I like Bigfoot, so it's like in the middle, but I'm Sasquatch. Really, yeah, I'm into Sasquatch a lot. 140 on the 401. The cop lights flashed me down outside Kingston. The officer said, Son, I'm just like you. Try to ease up and pass on through. I'm Chris. I'm a wax mannequin. I play music. I write songs and uh, sing them as often as I can. I'm pretty low key these days. I just play the songs, but there's, you know, by the end, I, I, I you know, so with balloons or sparklers or something, jump. I like to end end on a high note, get everyone dancing and and uh, confused. I think, you know, my my melodies are usually quite happy. My lyrics are are upsetting and and sometimes. And uh, I like to bring that. I'll tie that up with the bow at the end uh, and uh, leave everyone feeling great and dancing. I'm sick and scared of living downtown With that disenfranchised volatile crowd The bank man said he would sell us a loan For a no money down suburban home Let's write a no money down and cast her home the All right, what are the greatest challenges facing artists today? The signal to noise. The same challenge as ever, just a different medium to clarify your signal in, in the noise of other sounds. Somebody fixed it, I see. But a storm has come. There's a flood rushing in. It's up to my neck and it's through to my skin. Just the idea of committing to an independent, freewheeling sort of lifestyle is disruptive. You know, I just really admire people who've been able to build a life off of something that they love doing. Uh, and I want to be one of those. Fix this for me. Can't somebody fix this for me? Can't somebody fix this for me? Me. Jay Zbarth and I play bass in Sons of Butcher. I sing too. I do a lot of stuff. Yeah, I have I own uh, Zbarth Games Inc., which uh, we make video games, apps for PC, mobile, and stuff. Nice. And also in the Float Center, Z Float. So zero uh, sensory deprivation <laughs> tanks. Zero gravity. You did, <laughs> you, did more, you did more for Sons of Butcher than just that. You wrote it. Oh yeah. I, you... In terms of the TV show, I co-wrote it. I did all the art. Like I drew all the characters. Or designed them all at least, and someone else animated them. Uh, yeah, storyboards, stuff like that. Cool. And how about you? I'm Trevor Zebarth. I was Ricky Butcher in Sons of Butcher. I play guitar and sing. Uh, I play drums and bass on some of the recordings as well. And um, right now I'm a camera guy slash props builder, set deck guy in the TV biz, which is what I was doing before Sons of Butcher. So just continued on with that. Okay, so you have a Gemini Award? Yeah, we won the Gemini for, what, best website? Yeah, the worst Gemini ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we squeaked it in because our fans were nuts. It was based on fan voting. Yeah. It just went, like, insane. So they they probably, I think they changed the rules after that. Really? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. we beat, like, million-dollar websites, like, like real websites, and I made that with a copy of Dreamweaver in my basement, like, at night. <laughs> yeah, like, the website was shit, but was the shitty, fans man. were, uh, like, so rampant that we won. It was, like, we didn't even, we weren't even there. Yeah. Like, we didn't go. It was the producers that accepted it. Nice. Yeah, it was terrible. It wasn't shit. but no. it's shit by today's standards. But back then, uh, it must have been amazing. <laughs> it must have been, right? <laughs> it must have been. What year was that? That was 2006 or seven? Yeah, six. Yeah, yeah. Before six. season two? I feel like it was after. After season two? I feel like that was, like, the last. That was the death death rattle. Remember, because <laughs> when we got cancelled, we were like, but we won a Gemini! It's a Gemini award winning show! How are you going to cancel that? It's like, well, like, well you can keep the website really. going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, you know, the fans were so crazy that they started sending shit into Teletoon. Oh, really? Like, because I, I think that some show in the States got canceled, and then those fans started sending in peanuts, or then the show got renewed. So they heard that, and they're like, let's oh, send in meat! So they had a meat campaign. Ow. But it, like, culminated in them sending in a severed cow's head. No, heart. Heart. Cow heart. Severed cow's heart. And in a box with a, like a note written in like no, they cut it out like a ransom note. <laughs> so like, so like you ripped our heart out, so here's a heart or something. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and, the, and there was like an old lady filling in for the <laughs> secretary who received it and opened it, and it was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like that's when Teletoon like, was mad. They were like, like call them off. Like we didn't talk. We like didn't that. set it up, but Teletoon so was like, you guys. yeah, they're like, you need to tell your fans to stop, and then they put out like a statement. About how they've done enough Sons of Butcher forever. <laughs> like, you got enough, enough content for us to Yeah, there's enough of that. Like, two seasons, that's more than enough. Like, one season too many, like, basically. It's, it's yeah. They protested, but they like, flew in from all over. They, they did. Protested. Then we played a show in Hamilton, and they all came to it. It was like. Soft crazy. Crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they made a huge cow heart out of flowers and like presented it to Teletoon. It was like, nice. renew the show or else or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and we did a 10 year anniversary box set, which is all the seasons and all the extras and the tour in the Canada special that we did. It was a live action special that we did once. And then that got released. I did it all myself, so it was like for sure a loss. Like I didn't make any money on that. It was like so much time and effort and expensive. And I did everything wrong that you could do. Like I got, I was like, I'll get the big DVD case and it won't fit in the slot. So I ended up paying like twenty dollars to ship it, and I charged fans five or whatever. It's like, all right, I guess I'm gonna eat a thousand dollars in shipping. <sighs> so yeah, it's kind of sucked, but. <laughs> it's the story of Sons of Butcher. It's yeah, like always, we always there. fucked it up. We always did it the wrong way. We always way. lost money. Yeah, yeah, like we on our first uh, that first tour we toured in Canada. We had like a tour bus, and it was like Teletoon gave us money to do it, and we we're like we what, we were like we should tour the like tow the van with us. Like there's a shitty old Sons of Butcher tour van. And like we should tow it behind the real tour bus, and then we'll use it. We'll just like shoot with it, and we never fucking. We did bring it. our friends on the road and pay them for for deals. <laughs> Yeah. What? They got like all this like they made more money than us. Yeah, 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 <laughs> for sure. Like I get some band open and I give them a thousand bucks. And, like, like, it's like money just everywhere in the wrong directions constantly. <laughs> we never made money. Yeah. We always fucked it up. We we to, we uh, towed that fucking van across Canada. So you did it. Yeah, that idea. You know, it, you followed through. And on. It was a nightmare. <laughs> like, we had to abandon it in Fernie, BC. <laughs> it's like it basically. We got pulled exploded. over because the, the, the taillights weren't working and then we had to like get fix them on the side of the road and then eventually, this is the best part, on the way home we all just said fuck it because the tour bus was falling apart by that stage because we'd been, we'd been partying on it and then we all flew home and just left the tour bus guy to drive the fucking tour bus home with the van. So he's like driving this fucking thing and, and all of a sudden he looks at his side view mirror and the van and the trailer is like beside him. It like popped off and it was like driving itself and it went off into a ditch. He just kept, he just going. kept going. Like, Fuck it. <laughs> it was integral. The whole reason we had it was for the last show to have it parked up. Like it was on the side of the road in like Winnipeg or something. No one knew where it was. The cops had to search for it for like three days and they found it. Hey, we, made, we, we spent $10,000 on a giant steel Sons of Butcher sign with a fucking fan and the, the frames, right? But it was too heavy to lift, so we never fucking used it at any show. <laughs> and then the worst just part is, money. we're like, listen, we just get it to Toronto for the final show and it's like pays for itself because it'd be on the show on TV. It was in that fucking van when it popped off. Oh. <laughs> we never got it. It's like the biggest ten thousand dollars well spent. The biggest waste of fucking ten grand I can think of. Like you should just split it and like on the fucking rivers. <laughs> what the fuck? Shit, fuck the shit, fuck the fucking shit, fuck shit, the fuck shit, the shit and fuck shit, fuck the shit, fuck the fucking shit, fuck shit, the fuck shit, the shit and fuck shit, fuck the shit. Birds started going crazy. That's the birds started singing along. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pioneer Energy, for supporting the production of this film. Your support is greatly appreciated. 
We would also like to thank Long and McQuaid for their generous donation of the signature guitar and their support for the arts and music community in Canada. We appreciate their knowledgeable and helpful staff whenever we buy gear. It says Grant Avenue on. I can't do that. I'm going to have to cover it up. <laughs> I can always do this side and be cheap. QED shoot. I can't. Well, no. Yeah, it's, it's good. Oh, okay. gosh. Yeah. You ready? Hey, your focus. Me and Jesus Christ are on the. Me and the. Me and Jesus Christ got on the Hamilton Tiger Cats Labor Day game and I Boo they hated Toronto Argonauts from the visitor stand I always knew that our Lord and Savior's gonna be Hamilton Tiger Cat fan And Pinball Clemens says God have you forsaken me And Jesus says Pinball you're coaching the wrong team And then the Argos lose by a trillion points Wires of angels show up Sing Argo sucks. I always knew that Jesus was from Hamilton. Always knew that Jesus was from Hamilton. Me and the Jesus go drinking on a on a Friday night. And there's a super cute girl sitting on the Jesus is right. And she's been talking to some jabroni in a tap out shirt all night. And I say, Jesus, will she go home with him? And Jesus says, be a not on my watch. And then the locusts, they fly in. And the jabroni, he has got no skin. Always knew that Jesus was from Hamilton. Always knew that Jesus was from ha, ha, Hamilton. Nice. Thank you very much. No, thank you. The end. <laughs>